I'd like to invite Christopher up from Industrial Light and Magic. We uh, will recognize a lot of the slides because all the movies that we love and care for. Come on up, Chris. Hey, uh, thanks a bunch. I really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, I guess, you know, coming from the movie industry, when we get on a mic, you start with, well, I'd like to thank, and I guess I would like to thank everyone who organized this event. I can see Meg waiting in the wings. Matt, your emceeing is going great. All the <laughs> talks so far, the guys in the back putting all this tech together, and the community at large. That's really made this possible for us. Give me a brief moment while I get set up here and uh, make sure we're all good to go. And while you're setting up, I want to say my favorite line from your, uh, your description on the website is, from pixie to pixel, Chris is part <laughs> of the group ensuring infrastructure at large. Just like, I like that, from pixie to pixel. I don't know anyone else that gets to say that as part of their job description. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a cool walk in life. It's not what I've done for much of my life. Two years at Industrial Light and Magic. I have colleagues in the room. Um, Aaron probably wouldn't get mentioned any other time during this day, but Aaron knows the walk of life we've had in web hosting and just technology at large. But you know, to get to make movie magic today is a pretty amazing opportunity. So from pixie to pixel, yeah. Coin that one, that's pretty nice. I'm gonna do a quick audio test for the guys in the back of the room. Uh, the universal audio test at ILM is. Okay, just making sure we're good to go. Just thanks for that audio test. All right, so we call our project where we implemented and explored a lot of opportunities for any other tool to win the bill. The bill. Uh, everything we had ever tried before, everything that was on the market today uh, for monitoring, we called our project 3M. So it was, we wanted to have meaningful monitoring and messaging, not just what tool we use, but how we got notified and what those look like, and then how do we pave a platform that we iterate on for years to come to continue to provide that business value. Um, you know beyond just the set a check, get an email kind of thing, which was all we have ever had before. And we had tried every player in the game. Um, definitely Nagios, I heard mentioned plenty of times before, but everything from Nagios, Zabbix, PRTG was a big deployment for us. Uh, and that's a three layers of licensing sort of deployment that we loved reaping the, the, you know, the monetary spend on that back into our coffers. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I laughed too when I got there. Uh, but, uh, you know, everything was on the table. If one of those tools would have met all of our needs as we gathered all of our user stories, we would have adopted any one of them. Uh, but it turns out that kind of new kid on the block uh, had thought about things in the way that we needed to think about things going forward in, Sin forward in Sensu. And particularly something that was said at the opening of the day was this concept of multi-generational infrastructure. And I know, you know, if you've been around a company that's probably more than five years old, you've already got multi-generational. But we are, we're a 40-year-old company, and we don't change things if they're not broken. We don't always run. We never run the latest versions of practically anything. Uh, if it puts the prettiest pixel on the screen, we don't change it until there's a reason to do that. So. Um, Legacy is, is legend for us, to be, to be real. And, uh, and there's a lot of respect to that. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of burden from you know, the seats we would sit in in those waters to be able to manage something like that. And we also have the multi-generational aspects of code itself. So deprecation is not a word in our game. Um, and that in itself, you know the challenges that that can represent. Uh, a little bit about myself, um, I'll mention that before I was in computers, we all had to pay for our way to get here, and I was a chef for a decade, so I'll at least get a shout out to the sponsor there. Um, uh, different flavor, but I'm Cajun by nature, and so uh, you know we grow up with a real passion for the food we eat and the times we share breaking bread with others. So uh, I did a lot of that, and I still love doing that to this day, but you know there was no air conditioning involved. So uh, I moved into compute, and it's been a real road ahead. So. Uh, I'm pleasure to be here today. The question we had to ask as we started this project, and this project actually, I've been at ILM two years, pre-existed me in the exploration of what would be right. And so we don't make choices lightly or deploy quickly at ILM. We want to know that when we make a choice, it's here to stay and we're going to use it for a decade easily uh, ahead. So uh, what do businesses want from monitoring is typically assurances. 
They want to know that things are healthy, working, and functional for the business need. Now, we talk at a granular level about is that thing pinging or is that service responsive in the way that we expect to see, but in the end, that's not what the, you know, the, big, the big wigs at the top care. Uh, at most, they want a pretty dashboard out this thing, but in the end, they, they just want to know that they're going to sleep at night, deliver, a, in our case, a movie on time to a client we've bid a job with, and that, uh, you know, that they don't have to worry about it. Every minute in our industry is millions of dollars, and that's something you hear every client that is ever on the phone yelling at you tell you, but, but in our game, it's really true. So when we lag a single day, that is massively impactful to the bottom line for us. So being able to stay on top of health of infrastructure and assure that we can you know, keep the gears grinding is paramount for our business. And, and at ILM, what we aim to do is ensure that we're making the impossible possible. A director can dream any vision they want to put in front of your eyes. And I think we've all probably had a movie that's impacted our childhood and, you know, been the story we love telling and revisiting. And we want to make sure that that can keep happening. And we know that there's computers under there that are, that are bringing that to life. But how uh, do we make sure that that continues to grind on time and at least somewhere near on schedule is really what our monitoring platform was aiming to uh, give some insurances around. Uh, just to get started, let's take a look at a little bit of that magic that we've delivered lately. So I get to stand on the shoulders of giants to show you clips like that, but it does feel 
quite cool to be a part of the pipeline that you know, enables that stuff to really make that impossible possible. To know that every bit of explosion and fire you saw was never existing in real life. We don't do that in movies anymore. That's really cool. But to know that the systems that got there were assured to be healthy and delivering is really our job in, in the walk that I take at ILM. So what we wanted to do was really uh, create business intelligence through the platform we built with monitoring. And it's so much more, I think monitoring's the word, but we all understand that there's a lot more value to that. And so um, we set some guiding principles. Many of these I inherited before my day. There's definitely very little that's ever gonna be greenfield at a, at a uh, you know, 40 year company. But uh, in this case, you know, not just a little brown field, as someone said earlier. Uh, Trent, you did a great job, by the way. Um, but uh, you know, we really had to drag all of that into this platform. And so a few things that were going to make that possible for us were that we were going to leverage open source technologies that had to be done, especially with as many things as we wanted to proof of concept and battle test to get us there. We knew that we couldn't buy licensing for everything just to try it out and find it. And you know, Sensu clearly sets you on a path to Try it, love it, buy it if you need those extended features and, and take you through that journey. And I think we're a really good use case and user study for how to go through that journey. And we're early in our days of now deployed for uh, you know, several months now, but we see the road ahead down that journey that they intend as their business model. Um, I was already, I already mentioned I was a chef for 10 years, but I'm gonna go with Ansible deployed infrastructure, not for any other reason than that it was the easiest, con it was the path of least resistance and easiest to consume for our user base. And so we deploy not only our infrastructure, but the services themselves with, with Ansible. And when we ask somebody to consume this platform we've put together, what they will write is really small snippets of YAML, which is easier than say asking anyone to write Python or Ruby or anything if they've never seen that stuff before. You know, if the nature of their game is creating a pixel, writing a little bit of YAML is probably a lot easier to get to. We use a very typical three-tier deployment there where we roll through dev, staging, and prod. Um, Everything is authored in something that people can easily consume, either the tiniest snippets of YAML or in the native tongue of Ruby that we all uh, you know, consume on these platforms. Um, but in general, just the word there is kind of end to end these days, not that we don't have every flavor and type of code, we are a vast majority Python shop, which is another reason that Ansible sort of ended up being an, a better fit for us. Monitoring occurs in the location, so we're four studios. I work in our Vancouver, Canada office. Our headquarters are in San Francisco. We're also in London and Singapore. And a pain point of some of the previous implementations and even tools we proof of concept of today was that when I try to monitor a system in London from San Francisco, just the WAN alone uh, can be the real cause of poor analysis of the health of systems. So we have this deployment in all of our sites and that will assure that we get truth from our monitoring platform. Additionally, we cross monitor the platform in the other locations and have the opportunity to cross monitor services if the service owners deem that worthy. But we make sure that all of our infrastructure for this platform is cross monitored from the other three locations. So we get um, you know, some honest feedback about the health of just this platform, not just the checks it runs within. Data visualization must now, if we're gonna have individual instances in the footprints of each studio, we need to be able to still intersect that data and see a true picture of the global footprint and how we're, how we're doing overall in a global sense. And, and that had to be uh, available to us with however we chose to visualize this data. Um, and then we didn't want that single point of failure in the next tool as well. As we're building tools for the future and considering what platforms we adopt for any number of things we do in our walks of life at ILM, we don't want to introduce poorly architected or less resilient systems. So it had to be horizontally scalable at every tier, no single points of failure, really good technology choices, not just that we're making to augment against Sensu, but that Sensu or whoever the competitor would have been that we selected in the prior days. We had to know that they were making sane choices and not gonna introduce those vulnerabilities to the platform. And then a flexible toolkit so that th there's so many different things we do to make a movie come out the other side. We needed this platform, whatever it ended up taking shape to be. Uh, it had to be extremely malleable. It had to work across many code bases and languages, had to work across any kind of OS infrastructure, clouds, private and public, legacy. I, I guarantee somewhere in a corner there's a mainframe that we're using to do this stuff. Uh, so you know, had to have that sort of diversity to get us uh, to an adoption point. Um, additionally, once we went through those guiding principles, the way that 
we were going to drive this as a simple toolkit of our approach to the workflow was that we're going to use RPMs. It's sort of a standard we're setting in the studio today. So many of the tools we adopted had them already published, but we're rolling our own where they don't. So we have some muscle for that. And uh, once we do that, Ansible has modules to go ahead and deploy any RPMs. So that's an easy workflow for us. We have a Git-based workflow. I think that's pretty common across any industry these days, but it's absolutely abnormal in our studio. Uh, so it was semi-groundbreaking to transition into using a Git-based workflow, which I find very normal, but it, was, it, was, it took a lot of kind of pitching and selling on why that was the right choice there. Jenkins was already in shop before then. I think there's a lot of religious opinions about which CI tool's right for you. Um, I have preferences, I have opinions about all of them, but if something's in place and working, uh, you know, I'm not gonna fix what's not broken. And Jenkins was already in shop and, and well understood in many corners of the studio, so no point in changing that. And then we roll out in the three-stage methodology, so uh, dev, staging, and prod. Now I wanna take you through a little bit of the architecture of the platform itself. I mean, spoiler alert, you know Sensu's in there, but for us to get what we needed, I wanna show you everything that we have. And I think when we talked about building this platform, it had to be, you know, this platform's like ogres, and ogres are like onions, and onions are made of many layers. And so uh, I want, we, we had to consider what was necessary to layer on top. And I love the presentation just previously where they showed clearly Sensu as a main heartbeat of that, of that environment, but there's so many other moving parts that get you the business intelligence that you're after. So with that in mind, I think making a movie gives a really good illustration about how we actually make movies in these layers. And on a continuous basis, we're using a very CI-minded uh, methodology to actually put pixels onto the screen. So let's take a look at what some breakdowns look like of our of our workflows in those movies themselves. Countless systems will flock to the rebellion. When the battle station is finished, Governor Tarkin, the Senate will be of little concern. When has become now, Director Krennic, the Emperor will tolerate no further delay. You have made time an ally of the rebellion. Sweet. 
Well, I know you're hungry, but I do actually have to talk about some bit of what we actually do for monitoring at some point. But, you know, enough with the dazzling lights and pictures. But at the core of our monitoring, clearly I'm here on this stage, is Sensu. And we adopted community, and like I said, the roadmap that Sensu as an organization has paved for you to get your feet wet, see what you like, grow and, and even run all the way into prod installations with the community version and then the community at large that everyone in this room uh, you know, represents as a really power user subset is, is how adoption occurred for us. And so um, without that community opportunity, I don't know that Sensu would have had a dog in the fight. If we'd had to license the product just to find out it was right, we may not have been able to go through all the Disney legal hurdles to get there. I mean, I think it turns out with Sensu we would have, but um, you know, it would have been a harder road to say yes. And so this was the path of easy adoption. And so lots of, lots of communities do that, lots of tools do that. And I think there's a huge success gain, not just for the path to adoption, but also for the community and open source methodology to contribute and shape and build that tool all the way into the future. Our deployment looks like this, and this represents one footprint in one studio, and so we have four. And so when we look at that, you know, the, uh, the two node Sensu servers that we have, uh, represent that sort of failoverable cluster. We've got Rabbit and Redis as everyone else, but uh, you know some funny conversations that I heard was you know Rabbit's going away and everybody's all celebrating that. But for us, those were two tools that we had deep familiarity and trust with. That seeing them in the stack gave us some assurances that if they're doing it with that sort of mindset, then we know it will work and we can rely on it. So without those pieces. It would have gotten evaluated and probably had a strong candidacy, but we knew and understood that methodology and that shaped a, a, a much easier road for us to adopt because we use it in so many other service deployments throughout our studio. We have agents installed across many nodes and then we have proxy checks for many others. Uh, we do use Uchiwa and uh, for many of our users that's fine. They need to get in there and manage some maintenance windows or silence or acknowledge some checks. And since it's only been in the wild a few months, we're really just shaping this into the future and learning our footing at aggregates and building out more handlers and understanding you know, um, all the levers and knobs that are right on a per service basis. So that was what we needed. We actually really enjoy having all of those levers. Many people are after something that it's like, set it, all the defaults work for me, and, and walk away. And that is, that is in no way how we operate when we adopt tools in ILM. We need all of those extended levers and settings and even the opportunity to write our own where they're lacking is, is a huge value to us from Sensu. We're, we've authored at least or consumed uh, four handlers to date, one of them being Logstash. Inevitably, you have to put this stuff in someone's inbox, so email is there. Uh, chat uh, in two flavors. Hip chat and uh, Google Hangouts chat. And then SMS, we do have some teams, while we're not leveraging that handler on any of our checks in the wild yet, we do have some teams whose Zavixes and Nagioses we're about to conquer uh, where they do rely on SMS and via either direct SMS or tools like PagerDuty. So we, we have that already authored and available for them. Um, a couple of things that we want to call out, I guess, today in Sensu that have provided a lot of value right out of the gate were some of the plugins, and uh, we have literally installed all of them uh, because we do have that use case. Uh, although we may not necessarily be consuming very many of them today, we know that our roadmap now that we're in and we're in it to win it will eventually leverage basically every plugin there is. So thanks to all of you who author and contribute there, and we'll try to be better citizens to do the same now that we have skin in the game. Uh, but just a few to call out specifically. Since we use Ansible in our shop, it made a lot of sense for us to explore and start trying to use that. Um, we had a lot of playbooks already authored. We do use uh, every config management tool there is in other parts of our studio, but for this platform it made a lot of sense and it's mostly because that end user who's gonna consume this, it'd be a lot easier to get them to write some snippets of Ansible. Additionally is Jenkins. You saw that in our CI pipeline, so how we glue uh, some of this stuff together in the road ahead will be because of the benefits of the Jenkins plugin itself. And the one that I've had the most value out of, and I'm just really getting to have rubber meet road there, is uh, the most annoying way that I've had service outages in ILM is when the cert expires. Why didn't we know this was coming? 
Uh, it's absurd that we didn't have that. We have a new method, and for all the certs that have been installed and, and whatnot for the last several years, that's fine, but we had a large slew of self-signed certs out there, so, um, and, and will going forward as well, but to just have a little bit of sentience around this thing's about to expire, let's not have a service outage for something that is very easily avoidable, and in many cases with our self-signed stuff, just automatable to, to solve that. So those, those provide a huge value, and this one in particular, is, particular will help my phone not ring in the night. But Sensu alone doesn't get us what we need. Um, it is those plugins, and you can see there's so many, and we have all of these, we have a use case for every one of these, and so our road for this will be to start uh, working through our infrastructure and where we have monitoring in place for some of these things, converting or just consuming. If it's Nagios, we get really easy to just cannibalize that. Um, there's crazy elaborate scripting in cron foo that has become something called monitoring in different waters, so maybe not as easy to just cannibalize, but we're gonna, we're gonna go all in, and this is just early days for us, but with a path distant into the future where we do this work. But I do wanna show you those other layers that are wrapped around here. Uh, for us, service discovery is kind of important, and I guess I should mention that when we bring new infrastructure online, a vast majority of that, and it's not only, we have hardware, we have cloud stuff, but a vast majority of our services we deploy today run out of VMware instances. So through watching for a couple of uh, labels that we're applying on instances, we then can trigger off all of these things to get applied when a new instance comes online. So we've authored some Ansible roles, and based on watching some labels on an instance, we can then bring to life all of this layers of, of what we'll call business intelligence or monitoring from the 3M platform that gets layered on. For us, service discovery comes in the form of HashiCorp's console. And uh, anybody in this room, I, I heard somebody mention it earlier, but anybody consumers of console? Yeah, uh, it, it does great for us. Uh, DevOps for uh, several thousand members of our company, DevOps team for all of ILM is two people. And so we need tools that can provide uh, a lot of backbone for us so we don't have to go and do this individually. And console's definitely a winner for us. A look at our uh, implementation is quite vanilla to the console methodology, but in each studio we have the three node quorum. Uh, we take advantage of that gossip protocol that's built in and we run agents on everything and you know, scale that work out. So we have no concerns of that being something that falls over as a single point of failure. Um, we do intend and have a subdomain that we're starting to bring up to start taking advantage of the automation around DNS and load balancing so that we can uh, do more of the um, herd mentality than pet mentality with our VMs and services so that you know, console can take care of routing traffic away from an unhealthy node. We can redeploy via some uh, whatever config management is in place for the tool at hand, redeploy, re get it into the mix, so, you know, automatically alter some DNS and get that back uh, in a healthy state for that service. So that's what our road ahead looks like and console's gonna really help us get there alongside Sensu. Um, time series data, uh, I've been not so kind in talking about Ansible to one of our sponsors, so I guess I'll keep that going. Um, we use Elastic in this case and this is one of those precursor choices that we had a, a deep relationship with them uh, for some time. So, uh, you know, it was just the thing that we had a lot of skills and metal, uh, metal behind. So uh, if you're not familiar with the Elastic Stack, it's just another time series database, but you know, feel free to explore Influx. Um, we, uh, you know, all of these uh, tools, Sensu and Console, are, and, and any number of other services out in the wild, are continually dumping their data into Elastic backends. So we leverage a handler via Logstash with our Sensu data. We're doing the same in console to get that all in there. And all of this is so that we can then do what management always wants, which is visualization. Uh, they want to have a monitor that slaps up a pretty, uh, you know, pretty graph or a dashboard, and they want to have some knobs to make that look and feel the way it wants. And we're going to be investing in our road ahead a lot of effort to get that right. We've been doing a lot of user studies and finding what would they want to see, what would matter there. And hey, luckily, Grafana wins there. Uh, so we have been trying to formulate, and we already have some code that automatically generates a Grafana dashboard based on Sensu. Uh, sensors that get applied by default, but we want to understand how to shape and tune and make that a little more empowered. So if you're not familiar with Grafana, I definitely would suggest exploring it, but in the end what it does for us is allows us to intersect across all of these data buckets and whichever ones you have laying around for your service that we're unfamiliar with and let you build whatever the dashboard needs to look like for you. 
throw it on a monitor, or uh, we may use a Raspberry Pi for that. I heard some shade thrown at that, but um, you know, Raspberry Pi and a TV to get you your Grafana dashboard seems kind of reasonable to me. Uh, but then you can, at a glance, see all the data that this is fueling to know that you're in this really good, healthy state. Um, all that to say that um, you shouldn't have to care very much. We, we actually put a lot of thought into this hyper-complex, multi-tool platform so that you, ideally, don't ever have to really go use it after you set it up. Um, but with all of this complexity, you have to ask, how hard is it to consume? And that was what Ansible did for us, which was it let people write this file to get a huge value. So uh, you know what's, what's really here is these three bits here. I mean, tell us what your, what your host is, and then uh, tell us your, this, your, your service name. If it's got a port and a process, that's two things you could have if you're not running port and process. You know, you don't have to even submit those. So this is 10 lines, and most of that's not something you even have to edit. So, um, you know, if you did that and you call some roles and we're continuing to author more and more of those, what does that get you? Just these two roles, it's going to get you a whole bunch. Service discovery with console, it's going to get you centralized logging and all of the Sensu uh, monitoring that you'd expect out of the base level type of monitors, ping, CPU, RAM, disk, those kinds of things. Um, we have a library of growing roles in Ansible to let you consume any number of things. And with the toolkit we've selected, you can author custom, which is a very big need for us. We have a lot of proprietary tools that never leave our walls, so we have to be able to have this custom scriptability for that. And then, you know, lastly, with the handlers we've selected, the ability to author our own, you'll get the notifications in the place and style you like. And that's, again, something we want to continue to evolve to meet the needs of whatever that service and owner and team look like. Uh, and then the dashboards you want with Grafana. I think that's all I got. <laughs>